Okay, so this will be our final large group presentation now before we break for the workshops. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a panel about coordinating school, family, and conditions to really improve behavioral health outcomes. And uh, we're gonna have a number of panelists and I'll have them come up. And actually, uh, Tim is going to be our, uh, Tim Haran is gonna be our, our moderator for this panel and I'll have him come up. And uh, he works at CHI Health. Uh, there are a couple of child psychiatrists that could not be physically here that are also instrumental in this demonstrating this best practice. Uh, Joan Dotton, former colleague of mine, now at Children's Hospital, a child psychiatrist, and Sashi Badia works for CHI Health. Um, Sheila St. Amant, a CHI Health school-based mental health therapist, is also gonna be one of our panelists. Uh, Nicole Reagan from Charles Drew Community Health Center, school-based health center medical provider, is also gonna be joining us. Uh, Deltier Phelps, a parent, is also gonna be joining us. And Tony Jackson, school-based mental health therapist. So please help me welcome them to this panel, Coordinating School, Family, and Conditions. <clears throat> Those lights are bright. Ooh. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much for those kind introductions. Um, I'm Tim Haran, and um, I am with CHI Health. I am a mental health therapist by trade that works with child adolescents, and I also help supervise our manual outpatient clinic, and I support our integrated school-based mental health program with the uh, Omaha Public Schools and uh, Holy Name Catholic. Um, so today we're going to have a discussion about how we work with our community partners through the school-based health center and support the needs of the students in the schools. Um, but to start, I'd like to give a, just a brief history about where we began. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, Allegiant Creighton Health, or we're now known as CHI Health, uh, began having some discussions with school districts um, regarding mental health concerns and, and trauma of students. Um, the result of those discussions uh, became uh, where we decided to place licensed independent mental health therapists in uh, six schools uh, in our local area. Four of those schools are located here in Omaha. Um, they're Wakanda Elementary, Indian Hill Elementary, uh, Kellum Elementary, and Holy Name Catholic. And we also have two uh, schools in Council Bluffs, which are Wilson Middle School and Kern Middle School. Um, and these therapists are officed actually in the schools and integrate with the school-based team. <clears throat> Approximately about five years ago, uh, Building Healthy Futures began having discussions with the Omaha Public School District and uh, began providing uh, health care through a school-based health center. Uh, that school-based health center began offering providers from One World Health Center and Charles Drew um, which also include offering psychiatric services in several of those school-based health centers. Um, so together we partner to offer integrated health care and mental health services in our, in our local schools. Um, so today we're going to begin the discussions with the video. Our, I apologize, our, our psychiatrists aren't able to be here with us today, so uh, they provided a video ahead of time. So if I could refer you to uh, the case study that's located in your packet, um, Please feel free to review it, um, and we'll start our, our panel discussion. Um, the first question I guess I'd like to um, propose to the panel is, um, what, or how was this student, or how would this student have been treated um, prior to our community partnership between our mental health program and the school-based health center? I don't know, Nikki, if you would like to go ahead and maybe share from the healthcare perspective? Um, well, I, I guess one of the major differences, and it just kind of echoes what they were saying in the video as well, it would have been much more disconnected. Um, I, I think it's also important for me to share with all of you that I'm a family nurse practitioner by training, I'm working in a primarily um, pediatric and adolescent setting. Um, but we joke all the time in family practice that we know um, a little about a lot. So mental health is definitely one of those areas where we know a little about. 
And um, to manage a patient like that can be really intimidating. Um, and, and I would certainly need to call on several resources um, to even begin to work with that patient. Whereas working in the school-based health center, I have so much support around me. Um, I work at the Kellum and King Science locations. And so um, Dr. Badia is the psychiatrist that comes to our clinics. And I've learned so much from her um, and become so much more confident in my skills of managing a patient like this that I wouldn't think, um, you know, at this point, those patients aren't immediate send outs for me. I, I'm much more comfortable keeping them in the clinic where they're comfortable as well and managing that with this team. Anybody else have anything they'd like to share? I think I said it that um, initially she was seeing a provider outside of the school and which caused a lot of um, missed days of school and then meds were given and they might not have been appropriate levels so then maybe a couple more days out of school. It just, um, and, and the school-based health center is very good at not, you know, Let's, let's take this kid from this provider, it's what's best for that child. So in this situation, it was definitely um, beneficial for the mom too, because she had her own medical issues as well, to bring the services to the school um, and, and have them monitored there. Mom was very good at following through as far as coming to the meetings and stuff as much as she could. Um, but even at times where it may be that you know running out of meds or or dosage change or whatever you're able to do it right there and have that immediate access to it and for her it it was a it was a definite improvement we we really saw a lot of success with her that's great um, how about let's answer this question how would the student have been treated or how is the student treated after the partnership has, has formulated between the school-based health center and our integrated mental health program <clears throat> in terms of this case study? Um, well, with our current model, um, how things work, a student like this um, that would have presented to our school, for example, um, would have first come in to see me for a medical examination as well, because sometimes when kids are having mental health issues, there's some medical background to that as well. So we do just kind of a full screening on them to make sure that it's not you know, a hearing problem, a vision problem. Um, we check things like iron levels and um, lead levels and things like that, because that can all affect a child's um, development and, and the way they learn and the way they behave. Um, so we kind of we get the family into the clinic setting and get them comfortable with what we're doing there in that regard, and then we um, kind of loop them into the mental health services with our psychiatrist. And throughout that whole process, then we're also partnering along with um, you know our therapist and uh, the school counselor, social worker, principal, teacher, things along that line. So right from the get go, I would say we um, do a much better job of looping in all those resources and closing those gaps. I've, uh, Tony Jackson, I'm a school-based uh, therapist. I've had the luxury to work community-based without going into the school. And then when I took on with the CHI, I was in the school providing the service. Uh, much more success. Uh, there was a huge gap uh, just doing outpatient community-based therapy. In the school, we were able to build trust, uh, coordinate care, uh, talk with the teachers, and things of that such. Um, from a community standpoint, it was totally opposite. I felt as an outsider when I would go into the school to, to get information from the teacher and things of that such. But in this school, there was much more success and I felt that the family was more engaged as well. What, what would you say, Tony, are some of the strengths of being office in the school? Well, availability. I mean, uh, being able to um, family trust you. Um, in fact, I, most of my kids, they don't know I don't work for the school. I mean, honestly, they think I'm part of the administration at the school. Um, with that alone, I think that builds comfort and trust and things for that such. So they open up a little bit more versus coming to an outpatient clinic. Um, and most families don't believe in mental health, you know, so at an early age, I think parents tend to uh, misguide kids in particular in terms of what to 
let out the family secrets or whatnot, but in the school setting, I've had kids to open up where I wasn't able to get that success in the outpatient setting. Mr. Phelps. Hi, my name is Deltier Phelps, and I'm a um, student parent. Um, where I see this benefiting for uh, my family, it benefited greatly for the fact that um, I'm a disabled veteran, and um, I was have a lot of things going on. I lost my wife four years ago, and my son was going through some serious things. He was only six years old. Um, um, I met um, Miss Sheila St. Lamont, St. Lamont at um, Kellum Elementary School, and not only did she help my son with his grief, she also helped me and my family. I mean, it was it was more of a, a not just reaching out to the child. The child was first, and then through him, um, I developed a trust because I didn't trust and didn't believe in the mental health thing out of school. I just couldn't see it, um, but they had a complete team. I got to know them individually. Um, they took my son and um, got him to trust. He, he, he did really got him to trust it. So through him and him coming back, talking about uh, Miss St. Amant like she was an angel, you know, <laughs> talking about the nurses, uh, Dr. Badia, when he sees her, he hugs her every single time. And Dr. Badia was talking about the growth watching the kids grow. Um, I watched my son grow through the fact that when she came in, she didn't just ask him medical questions. She actually asked him about him. Um, how does he feel? Um, there was no secret things behind my back. Everything was in my face. If she, they had a, a question that might have been a little you know, iffy, they still asked it with me right there. You know, nothing trying to be sneaky or anything. And um, that's where it benefited my son to the point to where even after we moved, um, we were staying at this place. Everything is just it's more convenient. Um, I don't have to go to a doctor here or a therapist here. Um, his prescriptions aren't confused. Everything is right there. It, I mean, right there. So I can not only do what I have to do during the day. If something goes on or happens, I get a phone call. I mean, I get a phone call quick. Um, your son's not having a good day. Maybe you want to talk to him. You know, Dad, I'm not having a good day. Blah blah. I miss mom. Okay. Well, I Miss uh, Sam, mom got you. Yes, yeah, she does. Okay. So I feel good. I go on with my day, and um, I, I really, without this, I don't think that. It, I think it's saving the my son's future, because no telling what he would have decided to do. His depression level, his unattentiveness, and everything. But with his school-based health system. Uh, the medication is monitored. Um, it's monitored, and every time it's even thought about being changed, I'm called in. There's a meeting, um, two or three meetings, and I meet constantly with them. There's a consistent contact with us at all time with the parent, and I really appreciate that through the school system. It sounds like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Mr. Phelps, it sounds like that trusting relationship was very important along with the access and, and uh, the integration of Sheila into the school-based team um, to help your son continue his process with his, his feelings and emotions and help him be successful with reaching his goals. Um, do you see any barriers uh, that, that could have happened if that wasn't in place in terms if you would have had to go to a clinic outside of the school-based uh, program? Well, uh, well, outside of the, the school-based program, um, we had to not only, we would meet with one doctor, then they would send us to another, and then to another. Um, there was no relationship developing at all. Um, so not only did he not trust, I had tr problems trusting. Um, when he was uncomfortable, I was uncomfortable, because um, they would actually separate us and put us in different room. I would like to talk to your son by yourself. Okay, then he would come out like, you okay? Uh, Dad, I, I, I want to go home, okay? You know, so we're going to go home and we're not coming back here. But with this, um, I think, like I said before, it prevented him from going into a shell. Because it was, it was we, we became a family with the team. The team, we all just became a big team. 
you know, all for the sake of my son. Maybe now would be a good time to open it up to the audience for any questions about how our team works, how the integrated model works. Um, I believe we have some microphones going around here. Can I say something too? Um, we talked a lot about the provider being on the outside. I, I do want to make it clear too that um, if a child has real intensive issues or the family has real intensive needs, say um, in-home therapy or whatever, we do not hesitate to service out as well. That's, that's definitely part of um, something that we advocate and, and when we say we're partners, we're partners with everyone in Omaha, we don't just exclusively do CHI. It's, you know, we're doing Region 6. I don't even have to promote all of you because most of you are here, but I just wanted to clarify that. Sue Dutton, I'm a social worker with the Lincoln Public Schools, and I'm very impressed with the level of care that you're offering students, but I'm questioning if there is a cost to students or their families. Good question. Um, we recently, in the past year, started uh, billing for billable services. So, uh, for example, if, if Sheila is seeing a, a child in, um, in her office and they have Medicaid, um, we go ahead and bill for the service that, that's rendered. Um, however, we don't, we don't turn anybody away for not being able to, to pay. So that's a very good question. Um, if, if they do not um, have health insurance, we work with other community partners, such as Lutheran Family Services, to help them connect um, uh, with uh, uh, filling out uh, insurance forms to, to enroll them in, in health care coverage. I can mm -hmm. speak to it a little bit, too, from the clinic side of things. Um, as Dr. Dotton mentioned in the video, the psychiatrists as well as the nurse practitioners and PAs were all staffed there by the federally qualified health centers, um, One World and Charles Drew Community Health Center. Um, and so we also operate, um, it, they are billable services for both the medical and the mental health services that we provide there. Um, but if patients, if for example a child doesn't have insurance, we have a couple different avenues. First of all, um, most children were able to find that they are eligible. They just need some help getting them on um, you know, Medicaid or Magellan services. And so we have an outreach worker that um, works day and night to help people fill out all the papers um, because they know it's a very long and tedious process. Um, and just make sure that it's all done right the first time so that way when they submit things, it's not like we're waiting for someone to send a paper back and cross a T or something. Um, so we have that option. And also then if the child isn't for some reason eligible for um, insurance coverage that way, then we have a sliding scale fee that we utilize. And we do our best to work with the families and make it something that's very reasonable for them um, based on their income. And again, just like Tim said, um, we don't deny services to anyone, either medical or mental services at the mental health services at the school-based health center. So we're there to serve all, all students in the OPS system and their minor siblings, no matter um, what they're able to bring to the table, I guess. That's good. Sheila, maybe you could speak to just a, 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 an example of a student that maybe needs some support but doesn't necessarily need um, ongoing mental health care and how you, how you provide that intervention. Uh, well, that kind of goes along with what I said about some of the individuals at the school who may already have a provider outside of our schools. So we do uh, check-ins, high fives, um, just reminding them of what their goals were. Say we, we worked with them previously, so we have that relationship with them, and they kind of feel like, well, wait a minute, what about me? Uh, how come I'm not going to your office now? But you kind of explain that to them, but you're doing little high-five check-ins with them or seeing them in the hallway or, or maybe having a little chat with them with their teacher um, just to support the goals that you had established with that child or with the therapist outside of the school as well. Um, and that involves communication with that therapist of what their goals are and stuff and, and just reinforcing that in the school program too. So those are, and IEPs, SATs, uh, MDTs, uh, all of those meetings that 
that we get invited to. Um, we, we do a lot of that. We do a lot of consulting with the teachers on maybe figuring out a behavioral plan for the kid in the classroom. So say it's a specific behavior, coming up with behavior charts. Um, am I leaving anything out? You got it. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. St. Amant's, um, your reference to the high fives as well. I, I think it's also really cool that this is following that video that was just shown by some of the um, participants from the Great Plains Public Health Leadership Institute about stigma, because I think one of the really cool things about this system is that it breaks down that stigma. Like, going to hang out with Mrs. St. Amant is probably the coolest thing that you can do at our school. And probably the second coolest thing you can do at our school is come to the school-based health center. So the kids really love it. Like, it's not a bad thing. It's not a negative thing. Like, everybody wants to do it. And yeah. so for those kids that really need that service, um, it makes them feel a lot better about it. Great example. Yes. My name is Amy Cook, and I'm from Lewis Central School, so actually the other side of the river. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciated Mr. Phelps' comments, in particular about the trust level that you developed with the school team, and I appreciated your perspective with that. My question is, do you have any barriers with getting parents to the schools for those team meetings? Do you ever do home visits, or do you have a way to get parents to school if they don't have transportation, or if there's work barriers? Uh, yes. All of the above. Um, we have a family liaison at our school who helps out with transportation because, of course, as therapists, we can't transport. Um, I think I yelled out transportation when um, you were discussing this morning because it is a big barrier. Um, I've gone to over to the Matt bus stop and, and tried talking with them about getting um, bus tickets for our parents, and instead we kind of did a a little sludge fund where we have extra tickets if needed. Um, but we, we also have staff, believe it or not, that they're so involved, they'd, they'd go pick them up if needed. They're probably not supposed to, so I, I'm not naming names, but um, it, it, it takes a village, you know? So. Right, it's a total team effort. I mean, the school has countless amount of resources. I mean, they arrange taxis to go get families and things of that such, so whatever it takes. Uh, as long as we get the parent to the school so we can build the trust and so we can uh, make progress with that youth, that's most important. Mm -hmm. and, and if you have to do a home visit, we, we definitely have done the home visits as well. So. And if we have scheduling conflicts, um, typically, especially with our behavior health visits, we'd like to have the parent present just because those are often not just frequent visits and um, there's a lot more that's discussed, obviously. But for some students, uh, you know, Dell's son is a perfect example. There's some times where maybe Dell's busy with something else and we're just doing a quick check-in and doing a refill on medications. Dell doesn't necessarily have to be present for that visit. As long as we can speak to him over the phone and go over the health history questions and get, you know, clarify any questions he has for us, he does not have to be physically present in the school building, which is also very unique. You won't see that at any other clinic in Omaha, I don't believe. Uh, you maybe started to answer this with MDTs and SATs and 504 plans and things like that, but does your framework include um, like the behavior modification part for the classroom teachers and including school psychologists, social workers, counselors? I know OPS utilizes um, different role, different capacities, um, but does your framework include that and then does it include like a, within a multi-tiered system of support, so like tier one classroom level, are you guys providing any of that staff development and training on those proactive and preventative measures? And then one more question is, how many years have you guys been doing this and where does the funding and framework come from? Where to start? Where to start? Well, let me just address the funding rule. Yeah, quick. that's the easy one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, funding started on grants many moons ago, um, but as with any grant, uh, sustainability is always important. So it, it, as we've gone from grant to grant to where um, our, specifically with CHI Health, we have a community benefit um, department. And for the last several years, they have completely funded the program 100%. Um, which you might not hear out in the media because that's not something that we completely advertise. Um, but that's where we, we had to take a look at diversifying our funding sources and taking an honest look at, well, let's see, what types of services are we providing and, and are there um, insurance payers that are willing to pay for that service in the school setting? And there are. Um, 
you just have to you know go through the, the appropriate processes with it. So um, the the funding specifically for the actual like for exa example an individual session that's a billable service. But there's those check-ins, those high fives, those meetings in the hallway where you're offering some verbal praise and reminder of their goals. Those aren't billable services yet. Uh, to me, or to us, Valuable. that is a, a true example of value-based care. And that, that service or that interaction based on that relationship is adding value to that student um, in their academic setting, in the family setting. And, and to be honest with you, that's where healthcare is moving. So that's very important to, to recognize that because we need to keep up with those healthcare trends as well. Um, specific to population health, the population, the school health, or school-based population. So to, to answer the funding question, I hope that answers, your, um, that answers it. Was, what other part of that question I missed? Uh, Oh. Or, or do you, are you guys at all levels? Or are you just at kind of like a tier three individual student level? And then how do you incorporate um, the other professionals or clinicians within buildings? I know, obviously, I'm from like the public schools. I'm a school psychologist. And we obviously utilize people in different roles and like, let's say, OPS might. But just kind of, what does that framework look like down to like the classroom teacher of behavior modification of the school? Well, the, we always keep in mind whatever uh, OPS has, um, whatever the teacher has set up. You know, if they've set up SATs on the kiddos and, and that sort of thing, we would attend them. It's always their processes first, because we are within their school, but we are in addition to that. So we may go support, bring up suggestions at the meetings, um, that sort of thing. But when an IEP is done on a kiddo, Technically, that's their processes. Um, we can just be a part of it to support it, and um, I hope I'm answering that. I'm not for sure about the tier one, tier two, tier three. That's. Do you guys ever provide just like staff training on? <coughs> are you guys part of just like general staff development on increasing the knowledge base of classroom teachers and how to help deal proactively? Well, that is definitely something that we've talked about, bringing in the trauma piece and uh, the trauma-informed care piece to the staff um, meetings in the beginning of the year. They always seem to be so packed that we don't always have that access. Um, I did, over the summer school, a mini um, feeling slash depression seminar with the uh, teachers. Um, it's more of a collaboration with the teachers individually and the principals individually, if that makes sense. But we're always involved and supportive of the IEPs, MDTs, SATs. And, and that really speaks to the integration piece because if there's, um, we're, we're constantly meeting with the, the, the school-based team. And so if there's a, a need that arises, um, that doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to be providing that educational service. They, we might offer it from other resources within like CHI Health. We have a, an educational uh, consultant, Dr. John Lenhoff, who will go to the school and provide um, a workshop uh, to help support the school-based team. So good question. We have time for two more questions. Yes. Um, hello, yes, I um, would just kind of like to give a shout out. Um, I uh, attended a family team meeting. Uh, I work for Nebraska Families Collaborative, so there were several different entities in that particular meeting, social worker, um, you know, myself as a cultural liaison, and uh, principal, teachers, uh, and Tony Jackson as well. But um, the, uh, what I noticed about it was that um, actually is that the professionals that were in there had more of an ease, even knowing and hearing from the school counselor, the school therapist, um, you know, what would be very helpful in this situation. Whereas everybody kind of came with their own agendas and their own ideas, you know, he was able to put a perspective on it that was very calming, very helpful, very, um, you know, skill oriented. And um, I just wanted to say thank you for that. It was, it's a great experience, great program. Thank you. One more question. Um, I'm Emily Arkfeld, um, social worker in Bellevue Public Schools. And I know we've talked a lot about the cost, but I have just another question, um, two questions, I guess. First of all, so if a family has insurance, but it's still like $100 per, 
per visit if it were like outpatient? Is that something that then the family would be responsible for in your guys' case? And also, when you um, go to MDTs and meetings and things like that, is that also something that will be billed to insurance that parents may end up being responsible for? Um, to answer your first question, we would, we, we would connect the family with our, our behavioral business office um, for them to work out a, a business plan for, for payment and whatever that looks like. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the second part um, of your question, we would not bill the family for participation in that. That's just part of that value-based care, you know, that supporting in that team environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, well, thank you very much. I want to especially thank our panel today and um, also all of our community partners that have helped make this, um, this community collaboration with the integrated school model successful.